it's a pleasure to welcome Neil Foster to East Riding Libraries today to talk to us about horrible histories. Neil is an actor and is the artistic director of the Birmingham Stage Company, which has been putting on these terrible tales for 15 years. Welcome, Neil. Hello. So Excuse we me. have a host of questions for you, both from library customers and local school children. And we have a prize to give away for the best question. So if you'd like to choose your favorite question at the end, and the prize is two tickets to come and see you, in fact, in the production of Horrible Histories at the Spa, Bridlington, uh, on the 11th of October. So looking forward to seeing that myself. So Gracie asks, what's it actually like to be involved with Horrible Histories? What does it feel like? Well, uh, I'll explain what my involvement is, just so everyone knows. Uh, about 15, 16 years ago, I, I rang Terry Deary, who is the writer of all the Horrible Histories books, and I said, uh, Terry, I run a theatre company called the Birmingham Stage Company, and would you like to work with me and let's put Horrible Histories on stage as a live theatre show? And he immediately said yes, so we set about creating our first ever shows, um, which is what we've been doing for the last 15 years. And we've done all sorts of stage shows. So we've done Terrible Tudors, Vile Victorians, Awful Egyptians, Ruthless Romans. Uh, we've, uh, we've done Gorgeous Georgians, Vile Victorians, First and Second World Wars. Uh, and we've also done a very successful series of shows called Balmy Britain. That's the one that's coming to Bridlington. Uh, we, uh, we started this in 2005. The TV series that everybody knows uh, started in 2009. So we're not connected with the TV series. We know them, we love them, we watch them like you do, and we, we think they're fabulous, but we are just the stage show. So you would have only seen us if you've come to any of the stage shows. And as I say, we've been going for a long time. And uh, that, that's, that's what I've been doing. And I would have to say that being part of Horrible Histories is one of the best things I've ever been involved in. I, I did two history A-levels, so I like history. Uh, I, anyone who says they don't, they find history boring has probably got the wrong history teacher, because mm -hmm. I had two history teachers. One was brilliant, and he taught all the European history, and one was very boring, Mr. Winterbottom, and he taught, he was actually called Mr. Winterbottom, that is his real name, and he taught all the English history, um, and he was a very boring teacher, so I hated English history, uh, which is weird because now I spend my whole life writing and reading uh, and acting in English history. But I know it really depends on your history teacher. And most teachers are obviously fantastic, which is great. Uh, but if you do get the occasional boring one, that's probably why you're not enjoying your, your history subject, because you can't be bored of history because history is about, you know, Donald Trump is part of history. And who can say he is boring? And there's been a lot of Donald Trumps throughout uh, a, a human civilization. You just have to go and find them and read about them. And horrible histories. We love people like Donald Trump. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it's obviously caught people's imagination because Oliver asks, how does it feel to be famous? Well, I, I don't know how famous I am. I think anyone who comes to see the shows just occasionally, uh, people do say, I know you. And, uh, uh, and they've seen me in a show. Um, so it's lovely to be in, in the public eye, as it were. It's lovely to go in front of an audience and make them laugh and entertain them. Um, I do have very famous friends, like really famous friends, and I wouldn't want to be that famous at all because you, you can't have, you know, one of the best things about life is being, going to meet new people and, and being able to talk to them on the same level and, and, and then become interested in you because of you. And I think when, it's, when you're really famous, people are interested in you and like you just because you're famous. And that can be very lonely after a while. And I have a lot of famous friends who can get very, very lonely because they find it so hard. So I wouldn't ever think being really famous is worth it. Um, but it's nice if people occasionally know, know what you are, know what you do, and that's always fun. Thank you. So uh, Rachel would like to know which you think was the most horrible period of history. Well, fortunately for me, virtually the entire time that the human race has been on the planet has been really horrible. <laughs> um, the Romans were very good at being horrible because you may know that in what they created was a big theater in Rome called the Colosseum, except it didn't put on Doctor Who or even productions of horrible histories. They put on real live shows, a bit like reality TV, 
uh, and they kill people. And it got to a point where even the Romans thought they'd gone a bit too far. There was a senator who went to see a show and in the morning, this is just the morning bit of the show because they had shows running all day, they, they put in 10,000 criminals into the Colosseum and then they got the Roman army to kill them all really brutally with swords and whatever way they wanted to do it. And in one morning, you could have watched 10,000 people being brutally murdered. Now, I know some of us might think, you know, oh, that would have been quite interesting. But of course, the moment you actually really saw that happening, it would have been horrendous. So I think if I give my top award for most vicious people, uh, uh, I'm going to give it to the Romans. But of course, we can't forget that in much more recent history, Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, and Joseph Stalin, who ran Germany, Russia, and China in the 20th century, killed more people than the Romans could ever have dreamed of. I mean, they killed tens of millions in as brutal and as nasty a way as ever been made. So the good news for horrible histories is that people keep killing people in a really horrible way, even right up to the modern times, so, the, you know, in, in, in a few years' time, people will be watching uh, what we did because we're still doing horrible things. We've still got nuclear weapons that could do terrible things. The human race, we're quite a violent race when we want to be violent. Indeed. Yes. Indeed. Um, lightening the mood a little. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yes, still stand a... quite revolting. Um, <laughs> Johnny wants to know, what do you use instead of real poo, wee and sick when you're doing all these sorts of things on stage? Ah, uh, yes. Well... We tend not to actually have many of those things. We we do, yeah, we we do have poo features quite regularly in our shows, and that is actually uh, you can make poo out of anything really. You can make it out of cardboard or plasticine or blue tack, and then you just paint it whatever colour brown you want to, and that's your poo. Uh, have we ever had we in our show? I mean, we is very easy because that's just um, you make it with, and then you put a, a bit of food colouring in. So you can make it like a strong yellow, or you can make it like straw color yellow. There's all different types of weed, depending on how much water you've drunk the previous four hours. Uh, vomit, we have never vomited on stage, so I don't know how to make that. But I think you've always got to make sure there's a little bit of chopped carrot. Because I don't know if you've ever noticed, whenever you've been sick, somehow, even if you've never eaten carrot in your life, there always seems to be a little bit of carrot in it. So that, that's my guide for how you make your own vomit to scare your mum, go look what I did outside. That that you know that's what I would recommend you use. Make sure you get that bit of carrot in there. <laughs> um, what has made you laugh most while you've actually been on stage? Ask Sam. Ah oh, yes, I do laugh quite a lot on stage. No, not quite a lot. That would be wrong. Occasionally I laugh. I mean, for example, we're currently doing shows in car parks because a lot of theatres are closed we're actually about to do a show called Horrible Christmas in car parks around the country. Um, and the first time I ever stepped on a, when I say a stage, it was actually a lorry. The first time I stepped on the lorry to perform in front of 300 cars, I started laughing because I hadn't realized just how ridiculous it would be to perform in front of cars instead of people. I mean, there were people in the cars, but you couldn't see the people, you just saw the cars. Um, we did have a very fun show once at Hampton Court Palace, where we were doing it outside, so you need a microphone to make sure people can see you, and someone had forgot to put fuel in the generator, so halfway through the show, the, micro the microphones and all the light, everything went out. We had to shout our way through the rest of the show, and that may have been the funniest thing I've ever done, because we had to also make our own sound effects, because the computers had gone off, because there was no electricity. So we were speaking the lines and going, bang! at the same time as trying to do the show and that was very funny um the the technical word if you laugh on stage when you're not meant to is called corpsing i actually don't know why but if you laugh on stage when you're not meant to it's called corpsing and i and sometimes corpsing can actually be painful you know sometimes you're, you're laughing and you really don't want to be laughing and it and it's actually it hurts your stomach because you're trying not to laugh but you can't help yourself because it's too funny so um, I would advise against it. It's always best to avoid it if you can. <laughs> um, 
you've already talked about uh, one massive technical problem you've had on stage. So I'd like to know if you personally as an actor made a big mistake on stage or ever had an accident on stage? Uh, I've, uh, I think it's quite common to cut yourself on stage. We have a lot of props and swords and, and things, and although a lot of them aren't real, um, inevitably something cuts you. So you end up pretending that your character wants to suck his thumb, but actually you're trying to suck all the blood out of the finger. Not because you, you, you just don't want it to get on the costume, because if it gets on the costume, you're going to get in a lot of trouble with the wardrobe woman who's going, How, why did you get all this blood on this costume? Well, I cut my hand. I don't care. You've got blood on the costume. So uh, that's the most common thing is cutting your hand. Um, I think all of us, for one time or another, forget our lines. And so normally, if you forget a line, you just make one up that you think is similar. Or if you're lucky, your other actor on stage will give you the line so that you, you don't forget it. Um, uh, some people do have accidents on stage. You can trip. Tripping is very common on stage. Um, and that can be really quite serious if you twist your ankle or something like that. But fortunately, most of the time, because we've rehearsed the play and you should, you tend to know exactly what you're going to do and exactly what you're going to pick up, where you're going to put it. Accidents don't happen on stage very often because we know exactly what we're doing. So, um, yes, yeah, so if you want, if you want to act on stage, you're probably safer than being a deep sea underwater diver. <laughs> Thank you. Following on from that, in fact, you were saying that props sometimes can uh, can be a problem. But Rex would like to know, what's your favourite prop that you've used on stage? Uh, my favourite prop, I always like a good sword. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can pretend <laughs> you can really use it. Of course, it's normally made of plastic. So it's a bit, you can't really hurt anyone, which is a shame. Um, I did have to use a shovel with a lot of poo on it in a scene in one of our productions of Barmy Britain. And I did like that because that looked really nasty and you could, and you could pretend to throw it into the audience because that always makes them jump because they think you're throwing. So I would think, I think if actually my shovel with poo on because I threw it into the audience as if it was poo is probably my favorite prop, but you can't have it because it's mine. <laughs> Sticking with the theatre side of things for a moment, um, Sophie would like to know who designs the sets because they're all so very clever. Yes, well, we've got a fantastic designer called Jackie Trousdale who lives in Stoke-on-Trent and she's been designing all the sets for Birmingham Stage Company uh, for more than 20 years. Uh, and she's very, very clever. She sits at home, she reads the script and she comes up with ideas of how she thinks it should look. But what Jackie's very, very clever as well is having, she likes sets that always have surprises on them. I think the best set in that way was a production we did of David Williams' Gangster Granny, because we also do all of the big David Williams tours. And the set for Gangster Granny, every time something opened, it was a surprise. Suddenly a bed would appear, or a chip shop, or um, the, uh, this wall was suddenly turned into the Tower of London and the Crown Jewels. And that that is uh, why she's so clever. I do want to just quickly explain as well why I appear to be wearing a dressing gown. That is, it's not because it's very early in the morning, it's because I've just swam in a non-heated pool outside. And so I got very cold. And so this is to try and keep me alive, just in case you're thinking, God, he's wearing a dressing gown and it's quarter past four in the afternoon. It's, this is to stop me dying of cold. I wouldn't recommend anyone swims in a really cold pool unless you're really stupid like me. Well, Neil, we certainly want to keep you alive until uh, the 11th of October, because that's when the performance is here in Bridlington. Yeah, so, after uh, that. I'm glad you're happen. taking precautions. After that, it's yeah. up to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So who comes up with the ideas of how you're going to adapt the books for the stage? And how do you go about that process, Hugo asks? Well, Hugo, that's probably, I suppose, the most difficult and the most exciting bit about the whole thing, because I, for the last eight years I've been doing most of the writing for the shows. Terry Deary gets involved a lot of the time as well and he's fantastic. Um, but the ideas come from everywhere. A lot of our ideas come from the Horrible Histories books. Sometimes you open a newspaper and it's got a story in it and you think, ah, that could be uh, a good story for Horrible Histories. Very often I read book reviews because sometimes they'll pick out a story that's in a book. So I buy the book, I read the book, and then I think that's a great story. 
Um, I recently, for example, found a great story of a man in the reign of Henry IV. This is going back to the 14th century. And this man um, called John Bradbury, he said that he didn't believe that the bread that you eat in church was the body of Christ. And he didn't believe the wine was the blood of Christ. So he was only the second man in English history to be sentenced to be burnt to death. So they put him in a barrel and they put him on the fire and they lit it. And all the important people in the church and the Prince of Wales were standing there. But the screams from John were so awful that the Prince of Wales said, stop this, stop this. I can't stand this. He's screaming. So he went up to John and talked to him in the barrel and said, listen, if you'll just agree that the bread and the blood are from the body of Christ, I'll let you out of the barrel and I'll give you a pension for life. And John said, no, burn me. So he said, okay, you really don't want to be saved and have a pension for life and not have to be, and he said, no, because I don't agree with you. So they set fire to the barrel and burnt him to death. And I think that's, that's a very good story. So uh, we will be doing that story on stage. And it's that sort of story is what makes you laugh about being a human being because we're all nutters. And um, <laughs> this, is, this is a great story to put on stage. So that, that was an example. When I read that story, I thought, I have to put that on stage because it, it's so unbelievable that it's true. It has all sorts of themes to it. Religion, heresy, as it was called then. You got a, a Prince of Wales who became Henry V, who's one of the great kings in English history, tried to be nice. This guy stuck to his opinion, which was a very, you know, incredible conviction of a man. All these sorts of themes that are great, but also it's kind of really horrible and really almost funny at the same time. But it actually is very funny, I think. Um, and, and that's the fantastic, horrible history story. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Alan would like to know, what would you feature in a horrible histories of the 21st century, should it be published one day? Well, we've got to have Donald Trump in that, haven't we? I think we have. He is, I think he's the most horrible man walking on the earth at the moment. I mean, there are a few contenders. I mean, let's not forget Vladimir Putin of Russia. Um, got to have Bonzalo in Brazil. I think it's got to include President Xi, who runs China. There's a lot of horrible people. So I would have those four if this was about world history, I think Xi, Putin, I think it's called Bonazalo, and Trump are at my top. I think we could have Boris Johnson in there just because we've never had someone who appears to have no idea what he's doing quite so much as Boris. So let's have him in there. And uh, Brexit is probably going to appear in, in a horrible history of Great Britain, isn't it? Um, I think that's going to be a big story. Uh, I've got to think back a bit. Um, and probably, probably 9 11, because mm -hmm. that happened this yeah. century, didn't it? And I think 9 11 is probably, you know, as history goes, one of the most extraordinary things that's ever happened in world history. So I, those would be my, those, we've got those people, and 9 11 will probably be the big things from with Brexit that, that have happened this century so far. So far, there's a long way to go, unfortunately, a long way to go. Very true, very true indeed. If you had a time machine, which historical period would you most like to travel back to? Um, so Julie asked that one. Well, as long as I wasn't a Christian, I'd, I'd really enjoy going back to the Roman times because I'm fascinated by the Roman period because they were so extraordinary in what they, you know, they were very brutal, but they're also rather brilliant as well in how they changed the world at that point. But I've always really felt at home in the Georgian period. I've done some plays set in the Georgian period. There's a play called She Stoops to Conquer, which is a great play by Oliver Goldsmith. And I was in that. And one of the great advantages in Georgian times is men like me would have worn a wig. So if you're going a little bit bald here, like I am, you know, cover it up with a bit of hair, but you, you wore a wig, so you look much better. And also I look very good in these long jackets that they wore. And... The Georgian period is when really the modern world first started to be created. And they were very naughty. They were very boisterous. They did, uh, they did really naughty things in Georgian times. And I think I would have been very at home, maybe even more at home in Georgian times than I am in the 21st century. I don't think I quite fit the 21st century. I think I'd have been 
I, might, I mean, I'd have probably died of my asthma much earlier, so I probably wouldn't be alive. But uh, if I'd lived in Georgian times, I think it might have suited me more, mm -hmm. which is a strange thing to think, isn't it? That maybe, maybe you, you weren't born in your favorite period in history, maybe, but there's, fortunately there's nothing you can do about it because we can't go back to the Georgian period because they're all dead. I mean, if you did go back, they'd still all be dead, so you'd be on your own. So you might as well stick <laughs> with the 21st century and make the best of it. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex would like to know, what's your favorite history joke? Now that's putting you on the spot, isn't it? <laughs> really is putting me on the spot, isn't it? What's my favorite history? And we might have to come back to that. That's fine. I don't immediately have, I've got lots of jokes that I, I'm putting in my plays that I'm writing all the time, but they don't quite work when you say them out of context. Mm. Because they're not sort of, here's a line, here's a joke. Um, you have to know what's going on for it to be funny. That's why it's harder for me to think of one, but I'll have a go. As you say, I mean, the thing about the horrible history is it's the way the story unfolds that draws you in. That's what makes it so funny, isn't it? It's not like a comedian just coming out with a one-liner. Yeah, Tim Vine, if you ever want to know a really, really he, Tim Vine, if you want to look him up, specializes in one-line gags. Every single gag he tells is just a one-line gag. It's, what about this? What about this? Well, I don't even say thing of that. I just says one line that just sounds funny as he says it, because he he's constantly twisting things. You think he's talking about one thing and then he twists it. So Tim Vine is better at telling one line gags than I am. So look him up and he will entertain you. Excellent. I shall follow that advice. Sadly, we're running rapidly out of time. Um, Lily would like to know how do you fake injuries on set? Uh, Lily, I guess that's all part of acting because acting is all about convincing the audience that what they're seeing is happening for real and has never happened before. And that's where it becomes really difficult to make it look like this is the first time that's ever happened. So we do get injured a lot in our shows and it's, oh, oh, that's it. That's the sort of thing you have to do. What you suddenly react, no, like that. And, and you imagine you've been injured. And it's, so it's just acting, probably shouting a little bit like that. And, and that's how you pretend you've been injured. It's just another thing that you have to do as an actor. But I think, Lily, you'll probably be quite good at it as well. So as well as putting vomit on the floor and asking your mum to come look at it, you could just walk into the kitchen and go, oh, you'll never guess what I did to my head. And she'll say, I don't know what you did. You go, nothing. I just fooled you. I was pretending that I was injured. This is a way to really get your parents annoyed and upset so i wouldn't recommend you do it every week maybe once every month that's my recommendation <laughs> okay so um just one more question i think is probably all we've got time for now um obviously other than horrible histories as they are so fascinating do you have any history-based book recommendations for children or adults asked ben Well, the thing is, you mean, do you mean re just real history books? Mm -hmm. I think Horrible Histories really does draw people into a fascination with history, as you say. Uh, again, I, there's a lot of great books I read. It's just, it's all I can think of are the ones I'm reading at the moment, because I'm reading all about different kings called Henry. <laughs> and uh, so all I can think of are all the books about different Henrys. Um, there is a fantastic book. Uh, Dan Jones is a historian that I think writes very well. And mm -hmm. he's written a book called The Plantagenets. Uh, everyone's heard of the Tudors and the Georgians. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of the Plantagenets. And they were the kings who basically ruled for the 400 years between the Norman Conquest and the Tudors. Richard III, who was beaten by Henry VII, was considered to be the last Plantagenet. So Dan Jones has written a book called The Plantagenets, and that is a very good book. So that's going to be my reg recommendation of the day. Thank you, Dan. That's five pounds from Dan. Thank you for <laughs> recommending it. And um, uh, that would be my recommendation of the day. That's only, though, if you've read all of the horrible history books. You're going to need to read those first. 
But when you've read all of, I think there's 53 books that Terry Deary has written. And when you've read all of those at least six times, we will allow you to buy someone else's book. And that will be Dan Jones. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to say, if you're looking for some good history books, children or adults, drop into your local East Riding library because we have a huge range. So yeah, there's a lot of good ones. Choose any subject you, uh, you like within history. It's just such a, a diverse and fun field. And it's been great fun uh, to actually speak to you, Neil. Um, what was your favorite question? I'm going to put you on the spot now. I think my favorite question was about how you act being injured because Lily it allowed me to pretend that I'd been injured. <laughs> I mean, I always, I almost have been injured because I've been swimming in a cold swimming pool, as I mentioned earlier. And I feel, you know, that was as much as I want to do today in terms of being injured. Uh, so I think that might be my favorite question because I might pretend that I've been injured for the rest of the day <laughs> just to make people wonder what's happened. Well, Lily, we'll be in touch with you shortly uh, with tickets for Horrible Histories at the Spa on the 11th of October. Neil, we look forward to seeing you there and thank you very much indeed for talking to us. That's great. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for your lovely questions and keep reading, keep watching the telly and come and see the occasional show whenever you're around. Mm -hmm.